We're going to talk now about race in the Constitution. And this is going to build a little bit on remarks that Professor Wirt made earlier. I'll remind you of those. Uh, they dealt with the issue of slavery. Uh, and then we're going to move forward uh, to see how the Constitution uh, has operated uh, in the courts on the issue of race and explore a little bit what the current challenges are. The Constitution itself uh, had a fair amount to, to uh, say about slavery, just as was mentioned earlier, not under that name. Uh, various provisions were included uh, clearly to support Southern political power within the new Federal Republic, the Three-Fifths Clause. Uh, uh, firstly, in Article I, uh, which allowed uh, states to count three-fifths times the total number of enslaved persons uh, when they calculated their population base for determining their representation in the House of Representatives. And then, of course, as a consequence of that, their representation in the Electoral College. Uh, and as Jay, uh, Justin mentioned, that, that helped preserve Southern power uh, in both uh, the House of Representatives and in the White House in the years before the Civil War. The uh, slave trade provision uh, prohibiting Congress from passing law abolishing the slave trade prior to 1808, uh, of course, material to the preservation expansion of slavery and the, and the political power of slave states because they could continue to increase their representation in the House through Im importation of slaves. Uh, and the Fugitive Slave Clause, uh, of course, uh, which required the return of escaped slaves. Uh, all of these were, were a part of the, the original package. Uh, and as, as Justin said, uh, in, included, I think necessarily, that was the contemporaneous perception, uh, in order to persuade slaveholding states uh, to sign on to the, uh, the new Constitution. Now, the Supreme Court didn't really have a major, uh, uh, well, they had a number of opinions uh, or issues uh, in the federal court system dealing with the constitutionality and meaning of the Fugitive Slave Act uh, and the Fugitive Slave Clause. I'm going to set those aside uh, because I want to go straight to uh, the, the, the more, the better remembered slavery case from the antebellum era, which is the Dred Scott opinion, and talk about what Dred Scott tells us about race and the Constitution. Race apart from slavery. Fugitive Slave Act and clause cases dealt with slaves, but Dred Scott dealt with African Americans as, as, a, as a community defined by race, whether slave or free, and it's really our first major Supreme Court decision to do that. Dred Scott uh, and his family uh, filed uh, uh, a federal or filed a lawsuit in uh, state court in Missouri to uh, win their freedom uh, based on a variety of theories, but uh, they included uh, most importantly the fact that he, he had uh, Scott had uh, at least one child born in a free territory, and he himself had lived in a free territory. Uh, while he and his family traveled as the property of um, a U.S. Army officer uh, whom they accompanied on their various visits. Uh, the Army officer incidentally died, as did his wife, and Sanford, who's the defendant in the case, was actually the wife's brother who became the executor of her estate. So they were petitioning the estate not to be included in the estate because they were free people. Uh, that was the lawsuit. And the, the opinions, and there are a number of them, uh, were all over the map. Uh, the one that we best remember and that made the, the biggest political impact at the time was the opinion of Chief Justice Roger Taney, of, uh, native of Maryland. Uh, and Taney's opinion included a number of things, but the one that I want to focus on is his originalist analysis of Article Three of the Constitution. Uh, which is a part of his uh, resolution of the question, do we actually have jurisdiction to decide this case? Article 3 says that the federal judicial power extends to include lawsuits brought by a citizen of one state against a citizen of another state. That's what we call diversity jurisdiction. And the Judiciary Act of 1789 had said the lower federal courts have jurisdiction to hear those cases. And the Supreme Court, which was constituted uh, directly by the Constitution, had jurisdiction to hear those cases. And Scott said, that's what this is. I'm a citizen of Missouri. 
Sanford's a citizen of the state of New York. So it's a suit by a citizen of one state against a citizen of another state. You can resolve this. And Tawney said, well, Sanford's a citizen of New York, all right. But I'm not sure you're a citizen of Missouri, at least for purposes of the application of Article III of the Constitution. And then he sat down and said, well, in order to figure out exactly what the Article III jurisdictional grant means, we have to figure out what the framers of that article thought it meant. And you've got a full multi-paragraph long explanation of why originalism is the best approach to judicial interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, and then he actually engages in the analysis and decides that the framers of Article III, when they said citizens of different states did not intend to include within the word citizens African Americans. And mind, not just slaves, but African Americans, period. So, as he says, no matter how much our thinking on this issue may have evolved uh, since the, the third article was, was drafted, was ratified, uh, we're bound to follow the intent of the framers. I believe that they didn't think that citizens uh, included uh, African Americans. So that's my constraint, that's what I hold. Scott and no other African American can bring a federal lawsuit under the diversity jurisdiction grant. So we have no jurisdiction. Now, that holding, which was largely ignored by lots of folks, didn't stop the Civil War, which there's some evidence to suggest Tawney thought it would but probably encouraged uh, the coming of the Civil War. Uh, that decision, uh, that portion of that decision was expressly overruled in the 14th Amendment, which begins uh, that all persons born in the United States and subject to its jurisdiction are citizens of the United States and of the states wherein they live. So citizens of the United States it's the same language. Uh, so citizens in uh, the 14th Amendment, if you're born here, it doesn't matter your race, you're a citizen. And that means that you're a citizen for purposes of Article III. Diversity jurisdiction, that's why that language is there. Now, there are other things that happened uh, in the 14th Amendment that relate to the rights of African Americans. Uh, the war is done. Uh, the 13th Amendment has abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment uh, then says that all persons are entitled to equal protection of the laws, and no person can be deprived of life, liberty, or property by a state without due process of law. Uh, those are going to be invoked uh, almost immediately in support of the rights of uh, freed slaves and, and other African Americans. And then the 15th Amendment will be passed in order to safeguard the right to vote uh, of African American males as it happens at that period. Uh, the 15th Amendment saying that no state may abridge the right to vote on account of race. So now we're into race. And race becomes the driving force. It's no longer slave versus free as it was at the time of the ratification of the Constitution and when the Supreme Court considered the Fugitive Slave Act and Fugitive Slave Clause. Now it's race, black versus white, uh, or other races as they come in, which is, which is we see in its earliest form, uh, a, a, an issue in that portion of the Dred Scott opinion. Uh, you all know the history. Uh, southern states uh, in Reconstruction and northern states to a certain extent uh, adopt what come to be called Jim Crow laws. Uh, there's, the, this is, uh, at an, uh, in, a, in a sense, um, anticipating a decision that's going to be handed down uh, in 1896 called Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, these early laws uh, are, they're, they're not, I guess, technically speaking, Jim Crow in the sense of providing separate uh, facilities for people defined by race. They're, they're, more, ex they're more overtly exclusionary than that. So a uh, state passes a law saying, if you want to sit on a jury, you have to be white. Black people can't sit on juries. Well, that raises an equal protection challenge. Uh, black people can't do this. We don't care that they're free. Uh, so there's, there's a, a, a generation or so where, where that's the norm. And, and a lot of these statutes, these state statutes, are, are beaten back. Uh, eventually, however, 
the Supreme Court and, and the country as a whole, uh, perhaps partly in an attempt to, uh, to heal itself uh, after the war, to, to, to allow the tensions between the northern whites and southern whites to relax a little bit, uh, the Supreme Court takes a case called Plessy versus Ferguson and actually decides in favor of state separate treatment. Uh, and uh, I'll say a word about Plessy, uh, and then we'll see how, how that compromise, this is essentially a compromise rule, sets the stage for what's going to happen uh, for ha more than half a century or about half a century after that. Plessy, Homer Plessy, is seven-eighths white. He's got one great-grandparent who's black, and the rest of his great-grandparents are white. Uh, he, uh, this is a, a case that was somewhat arranged, uh, it lives in New Orleans, decides to get on uh, public uh, uh, transportation or get on a, a streetcar. And the, uh, but the state has a rule that says that if you're black, you have to ride in one car. If you're not, you have to ride uh, in, uh, if you're white, you have to ride in another car. And uh, he decides he's white, climbs into the white car, although he's one eighth black, and that under Louisiana law makes him black. Uh, and he's uh, arrested, uh, and so the Plessy case uh, goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, it, it's an equal protection. There are other issues raised. He claims, for instance, a due process property right in his whiteness, um, which is an argument that doesn't make it anywhere. Uh, but then he claims that there's an equal protection violation. And what the Supreme Court says is, well, we're not sure there is. Because, you know, had it been the case that transportation is provided for, uh, for whites and not for anybody else, you know, if, if you're black, you're not allowed to ride in a streetcar, um, well, that, that might have been problematic under the way we've been looking at things since the Civil War. But, in fact, you've got a vehicle to ride in, and it appears to us to be every bit as good as the vehicle the white people are riding in. So there is no... Uh, unequal treatment here. There's separate treatment. You're being placed in separate uh, 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 cars, but but it's but it's not unequal. There's no there's no denial of equal protection of the laws here. Uh, so you lose. And what that granted to states then, to whom the Fourteenth Amendment applies, uh, is the possibility that if they if they want, they can't deny things to African Americans, but they can separate. African Americans and whites. And, and that's what a lot of southern states in particular start to do at this point. And, and they get these, these separate but equal rules, which is what they come to be called, get uh, challenged. Uh, uh, the challenges tend in the, in the early stage to focus on whether they are in fact equal. They aren't challenges to the underlying constitutional law assumption that separate but equal is okay. Uh, if it's not equal, you've got to make it a little better. If it's not equal, you've got to make it a little better. Part of the reason for that is the, the, the organization, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Charles Hamilton Houston and others, who, uh, who are, have decided they're going to take Plessy on, have decided it's going to take a while to get the court and the country around to where they're willing to get rid of this notion that separate but equal is okay. And that doesn't really happen in a big way until 1950. The Sweat case... Uh, Heman Sweat uh, applies to the University of Texas Law School, is denied admission. Uh, and Texas says, but we've got another law school you can go to, and it'll be great because you'll be the only student, right? It's the all-black law school, and it's you. And they didn't say this, but you'll be first in your class and editor-in-chief of the Law Review and all this sort of thing. And that's the case that the lawyers decided the Supreme Court would get. They would understand this because as isolated as those people are, they've all been to law school. It's the one thing they share. So they took Sweat's case up, and the argument was you can't, uh, you know, separate isn't equal here, and it can't possibly be because a lot of the value of a law school education comes from the relationships you develop with your classmates who are going to go on and do great and important things in, in the state. And if you're, if you're separated from that, it doesn't matter if it's the same professors, the same books, you're losing out. You're losing out. And so the Supreme Court said, yeah, that's, you know, that's how we see this. So 
So separate but equal doesn't work in this context. And that triggered the bringing of the next case, Brown versus Board of Education and its companion cases. OK, your honors. Well, if it doesn't work there, it doesn't work here either at the elementary school level. And this is going to wreck the whole edifice. Uh, and it does. Uh, interestingly, the case is argued twice. Uh, the first time it's argued, the court wants more information about the original intent of the framers of the 14th Amendment. So they come back a year later, new Chief Justice, Earl Warren, uh, who they listen to the argument and they say, we don't know what that means. <laughs> the evidence on original intent is too un uncertain. So we're going to decide this based on something else, which is the way things are, which is the way things are now. Brown versus Board of Education gay eliminated separate but equal, gave us a clear rule that strict scrutiny is the level of review if you've got classification on the basis of race. You can't do it if it's going to hurt a group, uh, if uh, a group defined by race, unless the classification is necessary to the satisfaction of a compelling governmental end. Uh, we know we talked yesterday about affirmative action. We know since the 1989 and 95 decisions in the Crossan case and the Adirond case, uh, now that's the level of review, even if the legislation or the classification is ostensibly intended to benefit a group defined by race, and we'll stick with African Americans here. So strict scrutiny in all instances, and that's our sort of clean rule today. But it's not the end of the problem uh, of race discrimination. Uh, and this is what I want to close with. Um, what the strict scrutiny rules give us is a way of resolving cases uh, that are overtly discriminatory, where the statute says white people can do this and black people can't, or black people can do this and white people can't. But it doesn't help us, or it doesn't directly resolve cases where the legislature says, well, we aren't going to say it, but that's, that's kind of what's going to happen. Where the consequence of a classification division that's based on another ground is discrimination de facto against a group defined by race. So for instance, um, let's just pretend electoral district lines. Um, where do all the black folks live? Well, we'll just carve them up into multiple, you know, and these sorts of things. So, oh, no, well, we didn't say all the black people get divided up. We said it's going to run down Greeley Street, right, the line. So that's not, that's not overt classification on the basis of race. So it's not strict scrutiny. It's rational basis, right? And, and those cases obviously are, are far more common since the standard of review has been set so clearly. Legislatures aren't stupid. Um, so there's very little overt negative discrimination anymore. Um, but there's a lot of legislation passed that, passed that leaves people scratching their heads and thinking, is this, is, this, is this a racist statute? Is that what's really going on here? And the Supreme Court's come up with a way of dealing with those. That's not entirely satisfactory, even to them. But I'm going to tell you what it is, and that's, that's where we'll close. The case, the landmark case, is a 1976 case called Washington versus Davis. Uh, what happened was uh, the District of Columbia Police Department had uh, instituted examination for hiring uh, and promotion as, as police officers. And somebody took a look at this and realized that all the folks who were passing, or a great majority of them, were white. And the black applicants weren't. And, and weren't getting these jobs. And so somebody thought, say, well, is the test rigged somehow? Now, it didn't say, you know, only answer this if you're white, you know, or if, you know, or something. There's no overt discrimination in the requirement that a test be, everybody had to take it. So it got challenged. And what the court said was, you know, maybe this is discriminatory, maybe it isn't. We have to come up with a, te with a test, with a way to figure out whether that's what's really going on. And so they adopted what we call the Washington versus Davis rule. And it's the rule we use now. And it says, if you've got a piece of legislation that classifies, and it, and it looks to you to have a disparate impact, if it adversely impacts a, a group defined by race disproportionately, then you can challenge it and say, hey, that's race discrimination. But before we accept that, you've got to satisfy us, first, that there is a disparate impact, 
And that's usually pretty easy to show. You're just counting hits. How many passed the test? What's their race and stuff? And you've got to show us that that was the intent, that the legislature or the classifier intended that that result would occur. And that's the Achilles heel of them. That's the problem. Because while it's easy to prove disparate impact, it's really, really hard to prove intent to discriminate because people won't say that. Or if they do, it's hard to find out that that's actually what they've said. The consequence of the adoption of the Washington versus Davis rule is um, we, have, we have few cases where plaintiffs have been successful in rooting out what may be sort of buried, unconscious, or hidden discrimination on the basis of race. It's still possible, and I should say the consequence is if the court accepts that there is both disparate impact and intent, then what you get is strict scrutiny. The court will say, well, this is the same as if they had just said white people can and black people can't, so that's what we're going to give it. But as I said, it's problematic because of the difficulty of proof. And that's one of the front lines now in, in, in trying, uh, as a constitutional matter, to, to, to sort through how we deal uh, as a political people with this so far very difficult, if not intractable, problem of, of race in the Constitution. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from Woody Young and the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu. Thank you.